as I was thinking about what to talk about today, I decided to talk about some work that is unpublished, but some of which has been presented, which I think could further impact outcome from prostate cancer. So I'm going to talk about our, our work on looking at DNA repair in sporadic metastatic prostate cancer. So these are my disclosures. So I want to give you some key highlights of my talk and hope to convince you about several things. One is that novel trial designs and ways to actually interrogate questions through clinical trials can really improve understanding of disease. And particularly I want to convince you that doing exome and transcriptome analysis from each patient with fresh biopsies can really improve our understanding. And this is almost like a screen in patients. That PARP inhibitors have significant activity in metastatic sporadic prostate cancer. And this is not entirely surprising since platinums had similar response rates, 30% response rate. That PARP inhibitors have activity in sporadic prostate cancers with DNA repair defects. And that our transcriptome and exome data confirms by allelic loss of multiple DNA repair genes in these patients. And my bottom line is that actually for a sporadic prostate cancer today, we should start routinely testing somatic cell, BRCA2, ATM, and other repair genes and their loss to deliver precision medicine for this disease. This work is supported by many organizations, particularly Stand Up to Cancer and Prostate Cancer Foundation and Cancer Research UK. So introduction, and I want to highlight the trial design because I think it's really key to understand that we in the clinic are trying to do through the best model in the patient, what you've just been hearing about in the laboratory. So our goal is to really develop molecular stratification methods for this disease, to treat each patient differently, and to improve treatment with minimal toxicity. Talking about metabolism for the last, I guess, hour and a half, the challenge with metabolism for me, and I sat on several boards, is actually selectively killing tumor cells is gonna be a significant challenge. So please, I beg you, help us figure out how do we kill that cancer cell and not cause toxicity, you know? Fatty acid synthase, a whole bunch of stuff has been studied in the lab. Selective tumor cell kill is key. So I guess um, we know that prostate cancer is heterogeneous. Work from, work from us is confirming that. This is work from, uh, I guess, um, Chris Barbieri at Cornell, Levi Garraway here in Boston, uh, and others. There's significant intertumor heterogeneity, but most trials still treat prostate cancer as one disease, to my chagrin. Mutations in DNA repair genes have been presented from, for sporadic disease, but actually most of this is not widely appreciated. In fact, we have been showing in publications that have come out this week and previously that BRCA2 carrier prostate cancers have a much worse prognosis, but actually for sporadic somatic cell aberrations, Really very little work has been done with regards to therapeutics. So our goal also is really to try and kill tumor cells selectively and work has been published from our group and others that actually PARP inhibition has selective tumor cell kill in BRCA carrier patients. So our hypothesis before any of the publications on the DNA repair defects in sporadic prostate cancer were published was that a molecular subclass of prostate cancers had DNA repair defects that rendered them vulnerable to synthetic lethal therapeutic strategies using utilizing PARP inhibitors and or platinums. And the key supporting data were that we'd seen activity in BRCA carrier prostate cancers. We had some evidence very early at that point for this investigation initiated trial uh, of um, anti-tumor activity, I guess, in some sporadic prostate cancers. And we published data in JCO of this cross resistance with platinum. And we, we knew that platinum had some activity in prostate cancer. And we published this work uh, before in the New England Journal. And this is one of my patients. And I want to try and convince you why I was so excited uh, to try and study this as sporadic prostate cancer. This man was sent to me with metastatic prostate cancer who progressed very rapidly on castration therapy. We then gave him docetaxel. He was really sent home to die at this point. This is in 2004 when I first moved from Texas to London. Uh, he went on a series of trials. He had radium abiraterone before they were approved. He was an abiraterone for about three years. And then he progressed on abiraterone with a rapidly rising PSA. And he was just back from a funeral in South Africa. 
and his cousin had died of prostate cancer. So I sequenced his BRCA, he had metastatic disease in bone and lymph nodes, and we found the BRCA2 mutation uh, by allelic loss in his tumor. So at that point, he got Olaparib. And he also had a BRCA germline mutation in one of his alleles with truncation. And he had a response lasting almost three years. And at the end of that, he had progression in one lesion. He got radiation therapy to that lesion and the, his prostate. He had a complete response and is still in CR 10 years later. This man was sent to me 10 years ago, dying of metastatic disease, referred to a hospice. He's in CR today, following multiple early clinical trials, including abiraterone and olaparib. Our work had led to our understanding that actually this was probably going on in these patients, that there was repair defects in sporadic prostate cancer. This led to this uh, Lancet Oncology paper where we showed some early hints of activity with uh, niraparib, another PARP inhibitor, in sporadic prostate cancer. But sadly, Merck closed the study, as well as hundreds of other trials worldwide, as they reorganized their cancer trials. But we had some evidence in a small number of patients, about, I think, 18 to 20 patients, of significant circulating tumor cell falls from hundreds to zero in a small numbers of patients. And I saw these patients myself. I was convinced there was anti-tumor activity. And in these responses, we saw no association between response and PTAN loss, between response and ERG rearrangements, as have been published in preclinical models. And the concern is that our models are so misleading. Preclinical models and their data have to be validated in the patient. So what about the trial? Well, this is, I think, what's really key. And I'll slow down with my talk here. The trial was designed to ask the question, can we identify the, the, the uh, I guess, the, the genomic aberrations in patients that lead to sensitivity to PARP inhibition, single agent, in completely unselected, sporadic, metastatic prostate cancer in patients with no family history? And this design is complex and involves initially treating all comers with sporadic prostate cancer, about 50 patients, most of which were in my center. The patients all got biopsied pre-trial, which for prostate is challenging because most of these biopsies are bone biopsies. And on each biopsy, we've done exome and transcriptome. We then identify a biomarker suite that associates with response. And that then at that juncture, that is purely an association. And then we pursue a validation set whereby patients with those identified genes in their somatic cells are actually put onto a validation cohort. The protocol is also even more complex because actually it allows us to proceed to a randomized phase two trial of PARP inhibitor against placebo two to one randomization contingent on the degree of anti-tumor activity of the single agent PARP inhibitor. The primary endpoint was response rate by PSA, circulating tumor cell camp falls, which is one of my other pet hobbies, I guess, and response rate by resist with a number of secondary endpoints. We were also studying a new way of imaging bone mets by diffusion-weighted MRI through a radiologist funded in my group by Stand Up to Cancer. And this is a trial design which I put together. So first of all, part one, unselected patients. If we see amazing activity single agent with a more than 50% response rate, we go straight to the randomized phase two trial. If we see no activity of any great note, less than 5% response rate, we end the trial. Uh, there's, so there's exit strategies at every part of the trial. But if the response rate is somewhere in between, as we anticipated, we are essentially working really hard to try and understand which patients respond. And there's a validation cohort, but we can still go to the randomized study, which we're doing now uh, in this trial. So we mandated biopsies from these patients, fresh biopsies. We've got the archival tissue. We've got monthly plasma DNA to look at clonal evolution, as we published recently in Science Translational Medicine. And we're doing sequencing from plasma. And actually, we are also looking at circulating tumor cell uh, DNA and RNA. We have PD studies that I'll present very briefly at the end of my talk, looking at repair foci like the ones that Raoul presented a few minutes ago. The trial population, very late stage disease, high circulating tumor cell count was mandatory. These guys had all had the drugs that we've now developed, abiraterone, cabazitaxel, docetaxel. Many had also had prior enzalutamide. So I'm going to present data on our first 30 patients, although we have now have data on 51 patients actually treated. Uh, so these are the patients. A high CDC count. Many have uh, extensive disease. 
almost all have widespread bone mats. About 30% uh, have visceral mats, that is disease in the liver or the lungs. And you can see the mean CDC count is 42 by the Veridex assay. So very poor prognosis patients. The drug was essentially well tolerated, no hair loss, minimal requirement for dose reduction, and that was primarily for anemia. Minimal grade 3, 4 toxicity, that's what we like to see with a drug. And the main toxicity really was anemia and thrombocytopenia. So the drug was generally uh, you know, not associated with the, 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 uh, the side effects of chemotherapy. In the first 30 patients, we've seen 10 responses. We have the same response rate now, more than 30% response rate in the first 50 or so patients. And you can see the CDC count falls at 12 weeks here. Here are the PSA falls. And the median duration of response is over seven months. This is a key slide. What you can see in the responders is 100% falls in circulating tumor cells using the synthetic lethal strategy approach for treating unselected sporadic prostate cancer with single agent PARP inhibition with counts going from 100, you know, to almost to zero, 97% fall, 102 to zero, 100% fall, 24 to zero, 87 to zero. These are really spectacular responses. Many patients being on trial for over a year now. And these are some patients. This patient was um, no family history of prostate cancer. He had a response lasting nine months. You can see, I hope, on the CT scan uh, that he's had a good response by, CT, uh, by resist. And you can see that the response lasted nine months, but now his CT scan and PSC is rising. And we're, we've got a biopsy at progression. We're now sequencing that. But we're also sequencing BRCA, ATM, et cetera, from plasma DNA. Here's a second patient, 70-year-old man, no family history, Gleason 9, extensive disease, progressed rapidly through multiple treatments. So, you know, he's had LHRI channel log, CYP17, docetaxel, complete response on PARP inhibition, really quite impressive. You can see lymph nodes is appearing, single-agent PARP inhibition, sporadic prostate cancer, lymph nodes is appearing, liver meds is appearing at three months, and the regression of his lymph nodes in his neck. And you can see in the whole body MRI, we, you can see that the yellow lesions that are at the metastatic disease, again, at post-treatment, are disappearing in the um, different types of MRI images you have here. And his bone disease, similarly, has fallen quite nicely with 100% fall in his circulating tumor cell count. And this man has biallelic BRCA2 loss, so, uh, as well as other genomic aberrations, but the synthetic lethal strategy in a man with no germline aberrations of BRCA or any other repair gene, again, shows anti-tumor activity. Another patient, this man has biallelic ATM loss, with sporadic prostate cancer again. But interestingly, one allele is lost by frame shift in germline, and the other, the other allele is lost by loss of, uh, loss of heterozygosity. Again, an impressive uh, response by CDCs and PSA, lasting more than a year now, still on study. And in the transcriptome analysis of his uh, fr uh, fresh frozen uh, tumor biopsy, you can see that the ATM transcriptome, uh, I guess, uh, gene expression, RNA level, mRNA level, is very, very low in a gene, uh, sorry, a, a cancer compendium for ATM uh, levels. And you can see here, this man has, uh, I guess, um, ATM gene deletion in the other allele. He's got frame shift in his germline, which is interesting for a, a sporadic prostate cancer patient with no family history. Another patient, you can see quite impressive PSA and CDC falls. And I, I hope you can see that in his, C, in his whole body MRIs, there is significant improvement in the white bone lesions. These are better described here. And if you look particularly in the pelvis, the red lesions are actually his cancer. Front on and side on at six months, you can see almost virtual resolution of his disease in his bone. This man's had another 100% fall in his CTCs. This is another patient, you can see again, this patient's now more than one year on trial. Significant falls in CDCs and PSA. Again, this man has biallelic BRCA2 loss in his somatic cells and normal germline. And this is his whole body MRI, the fusion way to the MRI. You can see again, really quite impressive re regression of his disease. A decrease in his tumor volume by, by a whole body MRI from 1.3 liters to 0.39 liters. And this patient continues on study after one year. We are doing biopsies pre-trial and at two to four weeks post-starting Olaparib. And these data are uh, coming through. Uh, I guess we should have them in the next few weeks. 
But I want to show you some early data. We're looking at repair foci, RAD51, gamma H2AX, 53BP1. And there's some interesting data coming out of this, so I'll show you some of our data. But essentially what I hope that you can see is these foci in the positive control um, of pink foci of RAD51 um, staining post, um, post treatment in this uh, xenograft tumor. Green is cytokeratin, pink is RAD51. And this is a patient biopsy. And what you can see here is that you see these central uh, zomal uh, RAD51 blobs, as I call them, but no uh, foci. This is pre uh, drug dosing, cytokeratin green, and a bone marrow biopsy. And post treatment, it's quite interesting that you see these blobs again, but there are no true foci in his tumor of cytokeratin green. You can see foci in his normal bone marrow. Yeah. So actually, we can see these beautiful images that actually, in normal bone marrow, you get RAD51 foci but you could get no foci in his tumor biopsy. So confirming that this uh, responding patient genuinely has a repair defect with no ability to form foci. So in conclusion, I think we're the first to have done a trial where we've done exome and transcriptome on every single patient going on to a phase two prostate cancer trial. I think we've shown that a trial that uh, can really ask a specific biological question using these uh, methods can really inform, um, I guess, our understanding of the disease. I really believe that PARP inhibitors are going to make it in this disease. We're seeing really impressive responses. The response rate in our first 50 patients is over 30%. Uh, I guess um, we're now pursuing the validation cohort. We're now starting randomized tri trials in 2015. But clearly, I think that DNA repair defects are common in sporadic prostate cancer. Perhaps more importantly, as I finished off our New England paper in 2009 on PARP inhibitors, we need to rethink molecular classification of cancer. You know, is this really important that it's coming from the prostate? Should we be talking about BRCA and S cancers? So we're now doing whole genome sequencing on these patients, and Mike Stratton suggests in his recent Nature paper that there may be ways to actually elucidate who's got a repair defect across all geographical sites of cancer I guess, um, wh where the cancer starts. doesn't matter that it's prostate or it's breast or whether it's, um, it's ovary, if it's a bracken -S kind of cancer. I want to acknowledge my many, um, I guess, uh, people on my team, particularly my fellows, Steve Jackson, who um, has been uh, helping, who, who made the far first PARP inhibitors, our International Stand Up to Cancer Consortium, particularly led by Arul Chinyan and Charles Sawyers, uh, and Phil Cantor and Levi Garrow here in Boston. I guess our PCF Challenge Award uh, to uh, Karen Knudsen, Felix Feng, and myself. The trial investigators, um, our trials statisticians, and uh, many others, uh, particularly, I guess, um, my, my lab team. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, fascinating work. Um, I was wondering, given the difficulty sometimes to interpret mutations in DNA repair genes, whether they're functional or not, with your foci assay in the end, what's your experience? Could that be actually like a, a powerful assay to select PARP inhibitor sensitive tumors no matter what the genomic background is? Does that work in your hands? Yeah, good question. So we tried to do the foci on circulating tumor cells, to be honest, and spend a lot of time doing this. But my pathologist says he wants 150 cells, to be sure. So, you know, and you can't get that many cells that are truly viable. In fact, many of those cells in blood, as you may know, are actually apoptotic, and the protein analysis is very difficult. So, you know, I eventually decided that the, uh, the gold standard remained tumor tissue, and that's why I went back to tissue. I think in the randomized phase three, it's going to be very difficult to do biopsies pre and post in 1,500 patients, you know, in, in 100 centers. So what's cool for us is that the genomic aberrations we're seeing are either truncating or frame shift or genomic deletion. And I'm very confident by our assays and our paper we published recently, we can do this from plasma DNA. So I think that's the best way forward. Uh, some of these patients have DNA repair defects. And you mentioned you had to look at large numbers of cell lines in order to find these or large numbers of tumor s samples. That's the situation with a lot of the subsets of, of lung cancer, uh, the mutational subset. So 
uh, has this kind of survey been done in other tissues? It's possible we have small subsets in many tissues of DNA repair de defects, which would be, mm -hmm. uh, for example, by allelic BC BRCA2 yes, uh, so defects. I agree. I, mean, I, I think that actually the, um, I guess the way forward, I think, is to do larger studies that span tumor types and just focus on biology and genomic data, you know, and I prefer DNA to RNA. With the RNA, I, I am anxious that actually the contaminating stromal uh, contribution to the RNA data makes it very difficult to interpret the RNA unless it's really clear cut like what I showed you for ATM in that patient. So, you know, I, I guess what I'd love to do is study with PARP inhibitors, and I know that David Sola is here tomorrow, wants to do a similar trial, you know, in all comer, you know, doesn't matter where the tumor type comes from. And if you find bodily loss of a key repair gene, you put them on a PARP inhibitor. Right. And, you know, it doesn't matter where the cancer comes from. I think that's irrelevant. Yeah. Um, so. You're using just the PARP inhibitor itself. What yes, about single agent. Adding uh, a platinum compound. So there are two key issues here. One is that synthetic lethality is about utilizing the underlying, you know, Achilles heel of that disease um, with a relatively non-toxic drug to achieve um, tumor cell kill. When you're adding platinum, you're really changing the biological question for me. You're really talking about chemosensitization. Moreover, we have done a number of studies, uh, and including phase one studies with platinum, with Jan Skellens actually, and combining full dose platinum and PARP is very difficult. You really have to decrease the PARP schedule to two or three days every three or four weeks. And then you're really going from truly synthetic legal strategy to chemosensitization, which is a diff different biological question. So I, I think that question actually is a different question that actually would answer a different, you know, something else. So I wouldn't really recommend pursuing that route at this point in time. PARP itself looks pretty good so far, you know, so I, I think we'll do that and we'll see how we get on. Um, I just have a, a brief comment. Um, I had a patient uh, with very aggressive pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. uh, golf ball size skin lesions uh, in complete response on a single agent PARP inhibitor, yeah. uh, heavily pretreated. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, th these guys have failed everything. They're end of, end of the line, and they're getting CRs, you know, lasting over a year, which for metastatic late stage prostate is amazing. I mean, yeah. I mean, the only drugs I've ever seen do that are abiraterone and anzalutamide, and even that is pretty uncommon. So, I would comment that BRCA2 mutations do lead to pancreatic cancer. Did you did you look at this? The patient did have a BRCA2 mutation, yeah. and we realized yeah. that because his daughter was BRCA2 positive. Otherwise, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, he did have a BRCA2 mutation, and we only realized that because his daughter had breast cancer and was BRCA2 positive. Otherwise, yeah. he wouldn't have been tested for but, it. But the key thing for our trial is that most of these patients have normal germline, okay? So, you know, this is somatic yeah, cell some, aberrations is, of sporadic prostate cancer, which has not really been described much before, although we've got a paper just being submitted with the standard cancer team showing that about 30, 35% of metastatic prostate cancer have these repair defects. Wow. Yeah, maybe it's more a comment than a question, but I'm doing the studies on long-term survivors from ovarian cancer, and most of the patients we are recruiting had a history like your patient, like they keep developing, redeveloping cancer, and the new cancers in different organs, and they keep, they keep fighting them, they keep being able to fight them. And it's, I think it's interesting, our study is more designed on getting the primary tumor and see what's different between, you know, those long-term survivors from non, so primary ovary tumor, but it would be interesting to really get all biopsies for all the following tumors. We're doing tumors. all that. Yeah. So the key question for the phase three is, is the archival tissue the same as the CRPC tissue? That's right. And I'll have that question in the next four weeks okay. answered. So, Because actually the phase two will be based on the archival samples, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, great talk. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, so the theme from the prostate cancer and also the comment about the pancreatic cancer is that they've been heavily pretreated and, and now are responding to uh, PARP inhibitors. I'm wondering if the DNA damage repair mutations are actually induced by the prior treatments or were these early trunk mutation, mutations in the tumor? Good question. So the first thing I should say is that unlike breast cancer and ovarian cancer, you know, in prostate cancer, we don't use DNA damaging agents, which actually may be why these drugs are so active. You know, we know from our previous papers in JCL 
that actually if you've had a lot of prior platinum and are platinum refractory or resistant, PARP inhibitors are much less active in ovary. And that was published in 2010. So um, I guess um, the, the sequencing data will tell us, but my suspicion is that these patients a priori have DNA repair defects that actually predispose to them getting cancer in their somatic cells, and that could be an early event. To be honest, I don't have the, the data to, to confirm that. There is some very nice data that actually they indicate that the rearrangements you get in prostate cancer, the ETS rearrangements, et cetera, actually will not happen unless you have an HR defect, but fully proficient NHJ DNA repair. Beautiful, elegant experiments published in Cell probably about six years ago or so, whereby they actually added onto prostate cancer, or prostate epithelial cells, sorry, hormone, then irradiated to look at generation of the rearrangements that Scott Tomlins described in Science 2005. And you could get these rearrangements generated, but actually that was pretty difficult, and actually it took a long time. But if you knocked out HR, then actually the rearrangement just happened just like that. If you knocked out DNHJ, you know, repair, the, um, the low fidelity repair, you got no rearrangements, you know. So actually, I think that data would suggest to me that repair defects probably happen early. In fact, many of us are now thinking that actually DNA repair defects are going to be a big issue in prostate cancer period. Mm -hmm. I just <clears throat> like to mention that we have in the current phase one trial an inhibitor of PP2A, protein phosphatase 2A, which introduces a defect in several steps in uh, repair, particularly homologous recombination repair, mm -hmm. which by itself probably causes very little toxicity. In conjunction in animal studies with PARP, you sort of introduce the defect in DNA repair, and, then, and PARP is greatly accentuated. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. And yeah, I'd love to. Is interested in, All right. Uh, I mean, I, th I, I think targeting repair defects is a significant way forward in, in cancer medicine, in my, in my view. So we're doing ATR inhibitors, you know, et cetera. You know, so it's going to be, I think, an interesting space. Right. Johan, do you, do you have any uh, information about how cells become uh, resistant or how tumors become resistant? Fantastic, they... yeah. There was a lovely review by Susan Bates and uh, Tito Fojo um, a couple of months ago, uh, I guess uh, that, or maybe a year ago, that described five different mechanisms. But to be honest, apart from the reversion mutations that we've yeah. published on in a male breast cancer BRCA2 carrier, um, we need more data. We are sequencing plasma DNA for the known aberrations we found in the exome data, sequentially in plasma, monthly, to targeting strategies. And what we've shown in a paper we published a month ago is that you can actually look at clonal dynamics by evaluating plasma. And you can, you can see different clones as appearing and coming back or, you know, so, so the question for us is as they progress, does that same BRCA mutation return? Yeah. Um, the other thing is that we're giving all these patients when they progress platinum. Uh, so my question is, when they progress, are they still platinum sensitive? And uh, I didn't have time to actually um, me uh, mention earlier, I should have done, but in the, my patient that was progressing on Olaparib, that I showed you, that then got radiotherapy and had a complete response, the bracket carrier that I showed you earlier. So this man was progressing on Olaparib with a rising PSA. He had really one main site of disease in the sacrum, and we worried that he had prostate disease. He had got radiotherapy and he got a complete response. So what that means is that he was still radiotherapy sensitive, which suggests to me he still had a BRCA you know, aberration. So there is, it is quite likely that many patients progress with still that BRCA nest phenotype, which is why we're giving platinum after PARP in these trial patients. Mm -hmm. You know, I think with properly designed trials, that's a key thing for me. Um, you know, you can really ask some major questions and, you know, I guess so. We just all have to work together to do those trials. Has anyone tried the combination of uh, Olaparib with the ATR or ATM inhibitors? And see that's if happening. Good question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Can you comment on how we're going to find this clinically? In other words, for double strand breaks, like I would presume that you're going to need genomes, not exomes, because if you look at the exomes, you're going to really miss. You're not going to have enough of the landscape, and then. Is low coverage going to be enough? Because do you think that this is going to be enough of the events are going to be carried around by the colonially selected, or do we need to go down? Because this is a, n a non trivial issue about know, like what Mike Stratton said about how we're going to test this clinically. So, you know, my hope is that targeted NGS, you know, through, for example, MySeq analysis for 
and we've got a 200 gene panel currently we're using, will be sufficient. To be honest, for ATM, it's a nightmare. So we're doing ATM immunistic chemistry in my lab to confirm the genomic data. Um, for most of the genes, it's quite obvious. You get clear truncating, you know, frame shift mutation, you get lots of the other allele. So I think NGS may be sufficient um, for, for doing this target, you know, targeted NGS uh, analysis. I think the honest answer is that you may not actually pick up everyone with that, but if you pick up the majority, that may be enough for a big phase three trial. The bigger concern I have is what will the FDA think when you go to them with a whole bunch of genes and you say, well, actually, it's not just BRCA2, it's ATM, it's boom, 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 FANG, you know, FANG D2, et cetera. So I think that is a challenge for us to convince the regulators that actually there is a phenotype and that phenotype is associated with several genotypic changes. We are doing the whole genome analysis. You're going to do it anyway. You know, we've got DNA, we, we want to do it, and that is starting. But I, I just don't know that, you know, the bioinformatic challenges of looking at whole genome are, are, are huge. Mm -hmm. And um, there's so much data, so I just don't know what that's going to teach us yet. So, But, I, you know, I don't think we're going to be doing whole genome on all our phase one patients. Exome's very feasible, though. 